Hello from me, David Foster. If you're unfortunate enough to have contracted COVID-19, getting better may well seem like an end in itself. But what do we know about the long-lasting effects of the bug and what can be done about them? This is Round Table. The lungs are damaged, in some cases the brain and many other parts of the body too. Here we talk to experts and to a survivor still suffering four months after getting the virus. Millions of people have been infected with coronavirus in the last six months and hundreds of thousands have lost their lives. Many survivors make a full recovery but others have continued to suffer, and researchers are now studying the disease's long-term effects. Researchers warn that COVID-19 patients may experience long-lasting cardiac damage and cardiovascular problems, which could increase their risk of heart attack, stroke and lung problems. Doctors are concerned that COVID-19 could worsen existing heart problems. One study published in March found that out of 416 hospitalised COVID-19 patients, 19% showed signs of damage to the heart. Research shows some patients experience lung problems such as pain, breathlessness and a dry cough weeks after recovering from the virus. For other patients with neurological complaints, COVID-19 has been identified as a possible cause. While scientists try to find out more about the long-term effects, they serve as a warning that the virus poses a very real danger to health. Well, in a change to the way we normally do things on this programme, we'll meet our panel in just a moment. But first, we'll say hello to Athena Akrami, neuroscientist at the Sainsbury's Wellcome Centre, University College London, who got coronavirus more than four months ago, still suffering and Athena great to have you with us I know things are still pretty bad for you four months on and we're talking about the long-term effects of COVID-19 what have they been so far for you for me uh hi David and hi everybody thanks for having me here um yes as David said uh my first symptoms started March 17 uh very classic according to the textbooks of COVID-19 at the time, which was like fever and cough. And um, very soon they evolved into um, a plethora of complicated symptoms like uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, kidney pain, uh, heart palpitation, tachycardia, extreme fatigue, body ache, joint pain. And uh, I was hoping that, okay, they will resolve after a couple of weeks, but that didn't happen. And uh, definitely I'm feeling better right now, but far, far, far from my normal. I have been, I used to be a very active person going to the to, uh, gym three times a week. Now I cannot go for walk, any walk more than 10 minutes. And my physical activity is basically limited to bed to couch and maybe sometimes from couch to uh, um, kitchen. And uh, I have like uh, most of the days I have uh, um, um, elevated body temperature. And if I push it a little bit into more activity, uh, that elevated body temperature would, would evolve into a real high fever and uh, would really put me in bed for weeks. Um, and uh, joint pain right now, tingling in, in limbs. Um, I just very recently developed something that is called like COVID nail. You know, they turning brown, which is very weird after four months, uh, they started to appear. And like, uh, if I stand up, my heartbeat will go 150. If I take, a, um, take up uh, the stairs, again, I will go out of breath and uh, um, tachycardia. It's just, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, understand what's going on and um, kind of trying to take every day as it comes and see... Uh, uh, how the recovery will continue. I understand. Um, I, I know you believe you may well have chronic fatigue syndrome, used to be known as yuppie flu, ME. Um, I'm just wondering what you think the future holds. What are your concerns? 
That's a very good question. I really hope that the future at least uh, holds in a sense of medical community come together to understand what's going on. It seems we are under, we are kind of uh, uh, beginning to understand that this disease is not just a res respiratory disease, and it's a kind of a pan body uh, disease. It involves many organs uh, uh, at different levels. And I really expect the medical community to come together to, in order to look into uh, the pathophysiology that would explain these different symptoms. It's one virus, but it seems it is manifesting in different ways in different um, uh, patients. And I really would like future uh, um, um, studies help us to understand like this th th third mode of the disease. This is not mild uh, condition that would just like patients would recover after a couple of weeks. It's not an acute life threatening condition that would like send us to ICU and, and we would really need some critical care. This is, it seems a third mode of the disease and is producing this kind of a long-term uh, problems and yeah. it's not it's not clear whether it's related to some I don't know genetic uh, predispositions some uh, pre-existing conditions maybe some early treatment would define the course of the disease and so and I think that like really um, some multidisciplinary patient-led and longitudinal study will help us understand uh, where are we going I'm kind of afraid that Am I, do I have any organ uh, um, damaged permanently? I don't know because I haven't got any real help from the medical system. Yes, I, I think you said you, you felt as though you were invisible. Um, can I yes. just ask you, you're a neuroscientist who specializes in memory. Have you noticed anything oh. related to that with what you've got? Interesting, you see, so I, I kind of forgot one of the main uh, symptoms due to the symptom itself. Um, so it's something that we call it brain fog, which is like combination of confusion, lack of concentration, lack of clarity. I used to be very sharp in accessing my memories and remembering stuff. Now I struggle to remember things that like maybe happened like yesterday. And I don't know uh, what really what are the causes? Is it some really damage, neurological damage to the, to the nervous system? We do know that the virus attacks, um, uh, can attack uh, um, the neurons and gliosols and epithelial cells in the brain, but we don't know that these, these um, symptoms, the neurological symptoms that we see, it's a direct result of, of virus attacking central ner nervous system or peripheral nervous system, or they can be just like result of some crazy vicious cycle feedback loops throughout the body you know one one uh, um, uh, cause of the one symptom of the disease is extreme fatigue and insomnia and i as a neuroscientist i know that like lack of proper sleep can result in um, uh, uh, lack of concentration and cognitive uh, impaired so is this like just the secondary impacts of that insomnia and fatigue or these are really first order symptoms directly from the from the virus wow. we don't know that um it's extraordinary uh well athena thank you for sharing um what's happened to you sure uh, with, with us and uh, we wish you a speedy and long-term recovery thank you thank you so much thanks well now we're off to bergamo in italy center for the worst of that country's outbreak where we find roberto cosentini head of emergencies at papa giovanni the 23rd hospital also with us david strain senior clinical lecturer at the university of exeter medical school and gishley jenkins professor at the national institute for health research joint editor-in-chief of the respiratory journal thorax we welcome you back gishley roberto can i come to you first of all because it was your area that hit the headlines when all of this kicked off. You talk about people coming in, you thought it was perhaps flu, you then thought it was flu with pneumonia, then you realise it was something a great deal worse. Four months on, what after effects are you seeing? Okay, now we are uh, four months apart from the, the beginning of the, of the COVID outbreak, which started in, um, in Bergamo on the 22nd of uh, February, where we see what we saw in two months, uh, about uh, 2,800 people with suspected COVID acute infection. This is uh, the, the last week of February, the whole month of March and the whole month of April. From um, 
uh, from the month of uh, May on, uh, after the successful uh, social distancing and, and the lockdown in Italy, uh, we, we started to see few acute patients and incre an increasing number of, uh, of patients coming to our emergency department with signs of past infection and um, uh, complaining of uh, fatigue or uh, feeling of dyspnea or, or chronic cough, but without any acute sign or acute um, evidence of uh, an acute infection. And, and I think this, this is a, this open uh, another discussion among us clinicians about the chronic effects of uh, the acute infection of a COVID acute infection. Well, I, I will come up back and ask you, if, if I may, in just a moment, why you think these effects have been uh, seen. And uh, let's go to David Strain now. Lungs, brain, strokes, diabetes, heart, concentration, fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, skin rash. All of these are symptoms that I have read, and presumably as a medical professional, um, you yeah. can add to yeah. that list. So, David Strain, what have you seen where you are? Well, there seem to be two um, distinct isotypes of the, the follow on to the COVID. Um, there's a considerable number of people who are presenting with features that can be directly attributable to when they had it. So the people with respiratory symptoms and the scarring, people who had strokes during the attack caused by those small blood clots. But we also have a second group who didn't appear to be getting any major symptoms with the COVID itself but now are presenting with this brain fog, with skin lesions, with um, general tiredness, fatigability, uh, inability to actually focus on their day-to-day -day activities. And this is the more worrying version because from the outset, we've been saying that COVID for the majority of people doesn't cause a significant lasting illness. And yet now we are seeing people who only got mild symptoms at the time but have now been left with all sorts of chronic problems. How can you be sure they're linked? The, in each case where these are appearing, we, are, we can track it back to them starting shortly after a viral illness. And we now are getting the, um, the serotypes, the immunoglobulins. So we can now say that, yes, these people have definitely been exposed to COVID. And that's really the only thing that's changed. We do have a few other patients within our chronic fatigue syndrome that are getting activation of the long-standing chronic fatigue symptoms. And for these individuals, this is also starting to highlight whether we've got a different underlying cause of the CFS that these people have seen, given how common oh. other coronaviruses are in the general community. So let me get this right. You seem to be suggesting that if you've had something bad in the past and you get COVID even mildly, it can bring back... Um, the symptoms of that, that problem that you had some years ago and maybe even worse than before? Well, that's what we are starting to see. Now, we have to point out that we are nowhere near advanced, as advanced in time-wise as the Italians. So we don't have a full uh, repertoire. We don't have a full range of the impact. But if you just do a quick search on Facebook, for example, there's only over 40,000 people in a group for long COVID sufferers. And they describe a whole catalogue of symptoms that all come back to this, um, this original infection. And all of them will say that these are things that I have experienced at some point in the past, but have just been horrendously exacerbated by uh, this infection. Gosh, how very frightening. I would like to get on to the possibilities of understanding why in just a moment, but let's bring Gisli in. I mean, you're an expert in, in lung conditions. Uh, we know that that is where it, at least I assume we all know that's where it first starts to attack the body. What does it do after that? So the, the lung problems can be roughly divided into two. So that as, as was said just now, there's people who have underlying lung disease who then get COVID and there's a consequence for those people. And what we're seeing, uh, similar to what's just been described, for example, with asthma, 
is people who've had very mild asthma, haven't required much treatment, are suddenly getting much worse asthma. So there's the consequence both of the acute infection on people with chronic lung disease and then what it does to that chronic lung disease. And then more worryingly is it what it is doing to people with apparently normal lungs. So it causes a profound acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, in, a, in about 15 to 20 percent of patients. That's what set off the whole emergency lockdown was the high numbers of people who needed ventilation. And the consequence of that is if you have a profound inflammatory response in the lung, you get some degree of scarring. And what's really what we're trying to find out with some degree of urgency is whether this scarring is going to get better, which we hope most of it will, or whether in some people with an underlying genetic predisposition, they will go on to get progressive scarring, which would be quite terrifying. Oh, my goodness. Um, Roberto, it, it sounds to me a little bit like you, you can get knocked out by this thing and, it, and it's bad enough, but then it suddenly changes its personality and becomes a little bit like throwing petrol onto a bonfire. Uh, you're right. Um, when, um, when we firstly um, coped with the, the infection, we initially uh, thought it was a, a very bad uh, uh, flu. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, we, we started to see patients with a very severe pneumonia. And then we, we change our interpretation of, um, of the disease, of the, uh, the COVID disease, uh, in terms of very severe pneumonia. However, when time passed and, and, and we saw uh, several other patients with uh, acute stroke or uh, acute myocarditis, we... Uh, or, or with um, pulmonary emboli and venous uh, thrombosis, uh, deep venous thrombosis, we, we realized that it was a systemic disease rather than a simple flu or a flu with a special tropism for the lung. And this is um, the question we, we are asking uh, ourselves now what we should do uh, with this with these patients with uh, with systemic in, uh, inflammation and systemic uh, involvement and what what we should do with um, patients with had a mild, that had a mild infection but with chronic uh, long-term sequelae so in many ways, David, I suppose it's a great deal more serious than something that seemed almost cataclysmic in the first place. Um, it's much more serious now than it was then. Absolutely. And um, one of the issues here is this extension outside of the lungs. Um, whereas previous respiratory diseases have focused very much on the lungs, the way this entered the cells and the pathways that this used are actually pathways that are there to protect the body um, and they're there in the whole body. So this ACE2 enzyme that is activating the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cells, as part of our normal protective mechanism that was then switched off when this virus entered the cells in the first place, meant not only were the body trying to protect itself, but it was protecting itself without its usual defense mechanisms. And if these um, pathways have been switched off in the longer term, that could account for why the whole body is just not able to function properly now that we're in um, this post-COVID phase. So this is the ACE2 enzyme. Let's put up on screen something that's from sciencemag.org. It describes it as being like a key fitting neatly into a lock. SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19, uses a spike protein on its surface to latch onto cells' ACE2 receptors. The lungs, heart, gut, kidneys, blood vessels and nervous system, among other tissues, and I won't go into the rest, that those are the areas that are affected by this. Um, that sounds extraordinary. Uh, David, continue on this one, because I wondered if there's a way of actually attaching something to this particular enzyme, perhaps something we discussed in another program, which was about good viruses, and they use good viruses to help treat cancers. Is there a way you might hope of getting a good virus attached to these receptors to then take on um, the SARS-2, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. 
So that was actually one of the mechanisms that had been looked at as an alternative, but it didn't prove to be particularly well. I mean, I think what we're talking about there is using an enzyme as a way of identifying the right cells at work that require treatment. So a great example of that would be in a cancer cell. And if you can identify an enzyme that is only on that cancer cell, that's a good way of targeting a treatment. When it comes to this, the ACE2 enzyme, once it's activated, triggers a pathway that eventually activates the mitochondrial into protecting the cell. What we need to do is look at other ways of activating the, the mitochondria, the mitochondrial assembly receptor, that would then enable you to protect yourself whilst bypassing the, the, the ACE2 pathway. Okay, you've been surprised, Gisley, by, by what you've learned about this, not our not so much initially, but in the ensuing six months? I think, I mean, the ACE2 receptor is clearly the main entry point for the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it's not the only receptor. And I think people need to remember that. Uh, if you look in the lung, where there's huge amounts of damage, there's actually very little ACE2 receptor. 1.5% of type 2 alveolar cells express the ACE2 receptor. There's a lot of ACE2 receptor in the gut, there's a lot of ACE2 receptor in the kidneys, which get a lot less damage than the lungs. So either there is dynamic upregulation of ACE2, and we haven't found out what that is yet, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus is using another receptor, which would seem likely because SARS-CoV-1 also gets into the cells using ACE2, but it has nowhere near the same amount of problems, mortality. So, so it could be coming in by a number of different doors? Absolutely. So if we just focus on ACE2 receptors as a target for treatment or for, for decoys or for inhibitors, we're going to miss a lot of it. We will stop the initial infection, possibly, but we're not going to stop all the damage. So, so, Roberto, it seems that there's nothing that this virus can't unconditionally damage. Yes, we, what we knew, what we learned in, uh, uh, during our outbreak uh, is uh, what uh, may work when um, the great inflammatory phase has mounted in in the individual patient, let's say, uh, like um, uh, severe pneumonia. Uh, we know that in that case, an anti-inflammatory treatment like steroids could work. And we, so we observed this uh, during the first months of our uh, huge uh, heartbreak when we admitted uh, up to 90 new patients with acute COVID infection and among them, 30% had acute severe respiratory failure mm. needing mechanical ventilation. Wow. Dave, we that can, sorry, when, when, th I've got that. Thank you very much, Roberto. I just want to go to David if we make, so we don't have very much uh, time left in the programme. It seems to me, listening to all three of you, that you thought you'd see nothing like it when it first arrived. Then you saw something that was 10 times worse. Are you concerned that we still haven't seen the full amount of damage that this virus can cause long term? Um, well, we've not seen the, the degree of damage that's going on. I mean, uh, the nearest comparison for what's going on would be the 1918 flu um, pandemic. And we saw the, um, the Parkinson's-like condition that was characterized. I mean, the great film, The Awakenings, with Robert De Niro and Robin Williams described that. It is entirely possible as this virus um, gets to a larger population, that we could end up in a similar scenario when it comes to COVID-19. Remember the, um, the, the prevalence of COVID-19 within the community at the moment, it's only infected somewhere between five and 10% of the population so far. That means 90% of the population haven't yet been exposed to it. So we have um, a potential that if this goes around the rest of the, the population, we could see many other manifestations that haven't even been described yet. Well, I won't say it's been a pleasure talking to you, um, but it's certainly been very informative. Uh, we thank you very much indeed. And uh, 
Well, let's have you back on again in six months' time to talk about what more we've learned about what damage this terrible beast can do. Uh, Roberto, thank you very much indeed. To David in Exeter, we say thank you very much indeed. And uh, Gisli, I know you're coming back for some of our other shows on COVID science, so we'll see you again pretty soon. And thank you, wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. We very much appreciate your company. Go to TRT World Roundtable on YouTube if you want to leave any comments. You can also see many, in fact, all, I think, of the episodes that we've done over the last two and a bit years. From me, David Foster, from the team, thank you for watching it and see you next time, I hope.